Hello, folks. I hope to be back tomorrow. Um, meanwhile, I wanted to go over the next part of our outline, which deals with the idea of how colonization worked at the behest of those who were colonizing the Europeans. Now, the Europeans had built a pseudo-scientific kind of a validation of imperialism. And race became a distinguishing uh, feature of a white dominant society, subjugating and uplifting and civilizing in, in, the, in, the, in their current part of the lands. But they would use that to dominate societies, often by creating um, divisions within, even within societies that they were colonizing. They would favor certain groups, and that favor would be exchanged for their loyalty. So you would arm a minority group of people, um, somehow ascribing it to some martial feature within that group. And by empowering them with the weapons and the organization of your empire, you were able to use them to do a lot of the heavy lifting of colonization and occupation. The Europeans attempted to place their spice values upon those people that they colonized. And it's a little bit of a, a sticky moral wicket because we refer to some of this as ethnocentrism and ethnocentrism is the tendency for people to feel that their moral values and their views are superior to others and since the europeans had the economic and military power to be in the in the place of dominance they would they would place that upon those people now some of these uh, processes that go about it's hard to simply say it was all evil um europeans had brought ideas of some modern medicine and um, literacy to some places, which were certainly better off. Um, area, uh, practices like the, the sati, which was a tradition in much of South Asia, where widows were expected to dive upon the burning funeral pyres of their husbands and die and as human sacrifice, so as to not to burden the community. Those kind of ideas, and even the caste system within India, would be uh, challenged by, ironically, by the people of England, who, of course, took on a superior caste in the colonization of India. But the colonizers also um, dealt with the idea that women had a traditional role as being the civilizers and the religious people, at least in the lower roles, and the educators, where men took on more of the martial spirits. And again, many Europeans who were involved in colonization, who, who co heard the call, uh, were often seeing they were doing God's work or doing civilizing work. They didn't see themselves as brutalizers or, you know, or an ape, but they, they certainly felt they were doing the civilizing spirit. Um, many colonizers um, wanted to modernize society, but again, you didn't want industrialization to take hold in India. You needed Indian cotton in Indian markets. You wanted the European uh, factories, the English factories, to be benefiting from a relationship by which India provided both cotton and markets for finished cotton. So some of these ideas that come and, and, and change the societies of which they were being imperialized, like India or in Africa, many European values, which would eventually come to work against colonization, including ideas of nationalism, um, some aspects of feminism and modernization, that the idea was, <clears throat> in many cases, to be like England would eventually like to be independent. So there's some contradictions within imperial rule. Now, here's another picture of imperialism seen from the British perspective. And again, um, you could take a look at what is the feature in this picture? What is the overall feature of this? Um, what, is, what, is, what are we trying to see in this picture? How does it demonstrate imperialism and the rule of the English who obviously is sitting here reading a book, having his feet tended to by his trusty Indian servants? Now, Coercion is simply the idea you have ec economies in Africa that were not built to serve European industry. So the idea was you have the, the, the geography, the climate, the land that would be fitting for some useful form like palm oil, for example, for or cotton or, or sugar, as we've seen in the Americas. How could the, the societies of Africa, in this case, be converted for the use of Europeans? Well, one of the most brutal um, examples of how this would work to the detriment of Africans is what happened in the Congo Free State. Congo was actually the personal property of the king of Belgium, and uh, King Leopold had ruled it as his personal fiefdom. And it was to produce rubber to benefit the, uh, the Industrial Revolution in Europe and 
Belgium was going to become wealthy on this. But the system of coerced labor that is forcing African communities in Congo to provide so much rubber and when they failed to do so or when they were insubordinate, they were often tortured or they were or brutalized, hands, feet cut off. I believe millions of people starved in some cases. If you look at it in sheer numbers, it, it, par it pars with the Holocaust in terms of the deadly results of Belgium's engagement with Congo. And this forced labor was eventually forced to stop in 1908 because of international outrage. And maybe the the over-the-top brutality of this would create, maybe we might want to call the first human rights uh, movement, international human rights movement, because the world was incensed when reports came out of the Congo how brutal this was. So anyhow, these again, this was not just in the Congo, the Congo probably represents the worst part of that. The, the Dutch, too, could be particularly brutal in the tropics and with the Dutch East Indies, which is today Indonesia. So the idea of, of forced uh, or base or forced labor in order to prepare for the, uh, the needs of the colonial master was often uh, beyond brutal. So I was talking to you about the Congo, and here's a picture here that you talk about in the age when newspapers and photographs could be more freely distributed around the world. Pictures like this generated outrage, and you see two people there with their limbs cut off, and it was a result of Belgian power and authority in the Congo for the purpose of maintaining the economic need for rubber and um, coming out of that place. Now, we talk about this too. We could talk about how these this ideas of these economics and these the pull of the market would really kind of fuel the increase of the Colombian exchange. For example, rubber, which was indigenous in the Americas, would be cultivated in Southeast Asia and in Africa. Um, so products would be moved all across. And again, many of these places where subsistence labor and local economies had once ruled, the Europeans found it advantageous to drive their societies for cash meaning that they would provide a single crop, a cash crop. Now, they call this monoculture. Monoculture means simply like a community, instead of producing all the food it would need, it might produce, say, say for example, palm oil, which you can't live on. But the idea was you sell palm oil on the market, and then from the market you get money back, and that money you could go onto the world market, and you could purchase what you need. So in this way, imperialism helped to really drive increasing international trade in a, in a world economy. So the economies locally became weaker and I guess you could say less, less independent. And this is true everywhere. So the idea that, so no longer is a worker uh, producing 80 or 90% of what they need there or locally and trading on a market, but they're selling things to far distances and they're buying products from the world market. Now the problem with monoculture is that when you have a blight or when a product, when the price of a, a commodity goes down, the entire community might collapse. And that's happened in many cases, in many places over. So anyways, for example, in Africa, uh, coca or coke made for chocolate was, uh, was, was a huge export. And by 1911, it became a leading supplier of, of that, ironically, which, you know, was a uh, coca was originally from the North America. Um, rice from Vietnam. Um, and it really would transform the environments of these regions, and it would also kind of create, I guess you could say, single crop dependence, and it made the um, these colonial cultures more dependent on Europe, because uh, the Europeans could buy and trade these things from many places. And of course, where Europeans controlled the world market, uh, they were always going to make sure that they came out on top. Um, so um, we're going to take a look at that. Now, let's take a look at how the world economy worked. With wage labor, that's another issue too, is when we see happening is because of technology that more communication and faster transportation. Also with um, cities growing and with trade growing, uh, wage labor became kind of a common global market and where people like any product where they were cheap and available, they could jump onto, a, not jump on that easily, but they could contract their labors and move halfway across the world. So you'll have, for example, large in communities of Indians or Hindu Indians who are living now in the north coast of South America or in islands like Fiji, and they were they were moved by at the behest of the English. Um, they weren't forced; these were not slaves. These were people who contracted. But oftentimes, being poor and somewhat ignorant, they could often be cheated in these labor contracts. But again, they and their their generations that followed, you see diasporas of Indians, a Chinese. Like, you know, for example, many Chinese working in America building railroads. You see African migrants around the world and Asian migrants. And these people are coming in a much different condition than even the, the, some of the poor European migrants 
But between 1800 and 1914, we see the largest moving of human beings on Earth in a short period of time. So within a period of about 100 years, you see people moving halfway across the world and then establishing their lines and their cultures and their societies far apart from where their parents and grandparents lived. So, so we know that in Asia, 29 million Indians, 19 million Chinese migrated, um, and where there was European development of things like, for example, mines in South Africa, where there was need for labor, um, the call for labor would go out and Indian migrants would fill. And there's again, a large Indian contingent living in South Africa today. And again, apart from that migration, we saw this in Heimlich. So um, mines, like some of the labor and agriculture, was very dangerous work, and as often the most desperate people in the poorest places would accept that because, again, you don't have much to lose if you have nothing at all. So um, and gold rushes, like in Australia and Canada and New Zealand, would also invite some level of, uh, of migrants. Um, and oftentimes migrants would, would, if they had to move into the cities, would live in a ghetto or segregated regions, and um, oftentimes trying to share their their, their trials and, and difficulties with people who had like same culture. So here's an image of imperialism here. I won't talk about this too much, but we did a, a document earlier about Lipton tea particularly. And this shows you uh, the need, of course, for the British to enjoy the, the, the flavors of their civilization in tea time. So famously English um, tea like this would have to be harvested in places like Southern India and Sri Lanka by an English company. So the English are profiting at this, but the labor that's required is going to come out of areas, migrated areas outside of India, or not within India. So um, women in the colonial economy, you know, in pre-colonial Africa, women were usually the active farmers and had economic opportunity. But when colonial economies, when we see export economies and plantation economies, men tended to dominate lucrative exports and women were left with the subsistence agriculture on the side. So in many cases, women lost with the transition of Africa from um, local subsistence to global um, cash crops. Um, the colonial economy also provided some opportunities for women, some in small trade and marketing. Um, some women would escape patriarchy of their husbands by getting involved in, in some some small trade but there's also a greater fear of witchcraft you know when you have times of great change and uncertainty people often turn to their darker natures and to their insecurity so some of these uh, fractures are going to occur within the societies of africa because the transitions which occurred relatively rapidly within generations so overall the economic impact is a mixed bag because in some ways it jump-started many places like in Africa and in South Asia into more modern growth. But some argued the growth was uneven, it favored the Europeans, and often the environmental impact of this was, was again, difficult. Um, the, the, I guess you would have to argue that the, the major share of the benefits of colonialism most obviously fell on London, on Paris, on Berlin, on Rome, and Amsterdam and not in the cities of South Asia, East Asia, Africa. So we'll stop at this point. Here is a couple of key questions. Uh, this is the one, you have one short answer question set here. Analyze how colonial economies transformed economic systems in areas outside the West. Analyze one demographic consequence of colonialism on populations outside the West. Describe one positive and one negative impact of colonialism in societies outside the West. We'll discuss those on Wednesday. So can you give that a little bit of time? Okay, folks, I hope this didn't go too fast. We'll finish this up um, by the end of the week, I hope.